Shalom and Shana Tova. Happy New Year. I hope that your holidays were meaningful and pleasant and that whatever you did, whether you went to synagogue or not, that you found some spirituality in your life. Here we are now in the month of Cheshvan, which is often called Mar Cheshvan, bitter Cheshvan, because it doesn't have any holidays. As a rabbi, I see that as a bit of a relief and now have an opportunity, finally, to do another video Devar Torah, this week about Parshat Noah, Noah. And the part of the Parsha that we read this Shabbat has to do with the story of the Tower of Babel. It takes up just 10 verses in this week's Torah reading, and it's sandwiched in between two long genealogical lists, the descendants of Noah and his sons preceding and those of his son Shem following. Now, if your eyes glaze over when you read these lists, you're not alone. Hey, we go through quite a few, this one begot that one and lived this long and did that. And every so often we're surprised when something is mentioned about a person, such as Nimrod was the first Gibor, the first man of strength on the earth. In fact, the sages credited Nimrod, or more likely blamed him, for the Tower of Babel and the subsequent confounding, I love that word, of the people's speech and their dispersion all over the land. Nimrod's kingdom was the Valley of Shinar, which is where the ill-fated tower was built. Now, when you think about it, and at least one of our ancient sages did, if your goal is to build a tower, Virosho Bashamayim, with its head in the heavens, wouldn't you start on top of the highest mountain you could find? Not putting yourself at a disadvantage by starting in a valley, which is probably even lower than sea level? Hmm, definitely raises some eyebrows. Nimrod was Gibor Said Lifne Adonai, a mighty hunter before the Lord, or, depending on the translation, because of the Lord. In Rashi's commentary, Rashi being our greatest commentator, or one of our greatest commentators, Nimrod provoked God by acting brazenly. As a hunter may snare and trap his prey, Nimrod ensnared the people with his words, and in Rashi's words, caused them to rebel against the omnipresent one. Now at face value, this story sounds positive from the standpoint of people working together. As Margaret Mead said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And really, isn't this what we want? On the other hand, God didn't seem to like the idea of the tower. And the plain reading of the texts suggests that God sees this collective human endeavor as threatening God's sovereignty. And the only way to stop the threat was to make it impossible for them to work together. Divide and conquer, in a sense. But because no person is all good or all evil, Bereshit Rabbah, a Midrash, rabbinic story, on the book of Genesis, tells us that there were five good things about Nimrod and five evil ones. So let's start with the evil. He was responsible, somehow, for Esau, Datan, and Aviram, King Ahaz, and King Ahasuerus all people who caused problems for the Jewish people at various times. And the good he was responsible for? Abraham, Moses, and Aaron, King Hezekiah, and Ezra the scribe. However, all of them still merit God's compassion, even those who are trying to make life difficult. Bringing people together to work towards a common goal is usually a good thing but we need to be careful whom we follow. And that's not always obvious. May God grant us the wisdom and discernment 
to follow those who would have us work for good and for peace. I wish you a Shabbat Shalom.